Sweet, we'll hop right in. Yeah, yeah. Hey, everyone, welcome back to part two of um, our favorite movements for certain body parts, certain muscle groups. Um, I don't know why I said body parts, but muscle groups, you guys get it. Uh, we're going to you know, just hop right in. We had a lot of fun. Honestly, I don't know if, if Bryce was surprised by it, but I was actually pretty surprised by it because it was a uh, kind of last minute ad for a topic for a podcast. And I was like, actually, this is this is fun. Like, this is cool. It's straightforward. Um, but the conversation is fun um, from the people who have listened to it that I've heard back from. They thought it was fun. Just like hearing us not only give our favorite movements, which is what they get from most people on social media, but hearing rationale like, hey, like. This is actually why I prefer this. And we don't have some, uh, we're not, we're not arguing over angulation of hip flexion and why you get the, we're just like, Hey, no plain speech. This is why this makes the most sense. And any person, you know, who's at all familiar with the gym can go, okay. And take that rationale and apply it in other ways, choose a different movement or, you know, take it and uh, decide you feel differently about it and have your own rationale, but you can start from something and kind of have that internal dialogue and dialogue with others. Yeah, I think one reason why it's fun and like slightly more entertaining than something that we would normally be doing is just that like these are the internal conversations that happen in our heads every single day whenever we're working with all of our clients anyway. So like we're always having to come up with some kind of sliding scale for various exercises and movement patterns and how we want to integrate those into our client's program into their specific workout into that very 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 specific superset where we want it to be in the sequence of the workout how we want that to balance with you know the frequency of uh you know however often that body part is being hit so there are a million variables that we have to account for whenever we're creating a program and for myself it's it's almost so unconscious at this point where like i i don't really have to like sit and think about is a pendulum squat better than a hack squat or if i want to you know bring up my lats do i want to do a you know single arm high or high row or do i want to mm -hmm. do like a, a dumbbell pullover right so like for me i'm not really weighing those deliberately it's more so like all right this intuitively feels like the correct answer so i'm gonna go with that but I think I've built up that intuition for so long that I'm not even really taking a moment to think about like where that intuition came from and like yeah. the reasons why I actually favor certain movements over others. So having these type of conversations, I, I do think it's also helpful for me to just be able to walk through the the rational reason rationale behind why I prefer certain movements over others and like you know various use cases of exercises um you know when some might be better than others and vice versa so it, it's good for me as well yeah it's a an interesting point that i was talking to emily about and actually talking to Paige about a couple of weeks ago before we dive in here is it is all so unconscious to us right like we, we just do because you, yeah. you know, when you've done it for you know a decade plus, or, or in your case, even longer, with coaching on top of training yourself, uh, you know, sports, studies, whatever it is that you've done that now feels rudimentary to you, you stop talking about it because it feels so simple to you. It feels so basic, and you forget that when you say something that seems relatively like innocuous and common to you, and then someone goes, "I never thought about it that way." And you're like, what? Like you're like, you're like, you're like dumbfounded yeah. because you're so used to just being around brains and being in a space that all kind of feels like this, this is common. This is very easy. This is basic. This is rudimentary. But some of the most like basic things that we think about or talk about uh, is news. It's breaking news to some people. And they're like, oh shit, like that's, that's revolutionary for me. I didn't think about it this way. Yeah. No, yeah. I actually had a consultation call last week uh, with a friend and he was going through a, a, a fat loss phase and he had given me like a, a few primers on his current situation. And long story short, he had created a program for himself that um, he was aiming to use to capitalize on this fat loss phase. And, and he wanted me to look it over. So we jumped on a call and I was like, all right, let's walk through this. You know, what are your primary goals? What are your secondary goals? What are we aiming to maximize? What are we aiming to limit? How long do we have? You know, how often are you going to be able to train? What extenuating circumstances 
are we going to have to keep in mind as we are building this program out or modifying it? And I was just walking through it and I was like, you know, we really have it set up. I actually don't think it's that optimal for what you're telling me that your primary goal is. So let's go ahead and just kind of like wash it. Let's go back to the drawing board and let's build a program as we're on this call. And literally I was like, this is exactly what I would do. Pull out like a pencil and just write down exactly what I'm telling you. And it was like 15 minutes of me being like, I would do this, 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 use this exercise or use these like uh, variations of this exercise and just mm -hmm. pull in whatever you feel most comfortable with in that moment. Go through these different rep schemes. You can use these intensity techniques, use you know, this type of, uh, use these parameters right. for your accessory movements and rotate in and out. I was like, boom, boom, boom. Let's go through it like that. And whenever we finished, she was like, how do you know so much about this stuff? And I was like, I've just been doing it for a long time. So pretty much every situation that can come up i've seen it before generally multiple times and i've had to go through it and i've had to think these thoughts and i've had to problem solve and troubleshoot so what people might think of is like oh that's magic or like that's insane how the fuck did you just like come up with that off the top of your head it's like it's not that it's like i've gone through these scenarios multiple times, whether it's myself and my clients or friends or whoever, right? or I've seen someone else doing it. So yeah, I mean, a lot of this is just buried so deep in mm -hmm. our heads that it's not something that bubbles up to the surface on a daily basis. But whenever something does poke it, then it's like, oh yeah, now we're reminded we do actually have this shit in there somewhere, right? Like it, it, it's, it's deep in there. And sometimes we don't really know how to talk about it the best because yeah. we haven't had to talk about it in a long time but um but no, I, I really like going through just again reasoning rationale for like why certain movement patterns why variations are favored versus others you know maybe there would be a spinoff that we can do um you know something related to this this talking about like how we can program um you know how we can optimize certain programming workouts ways that we can modify it and stuff like that because again all of those processes are so unconscious for us, but being able to walk through it in a conversation might not be the worst thing in the world. And it also could be super productive for other people to listen to as well. No, a hundred percent. I'm, you know, I'm game. Um, this stuff is fun. Like I said, it's just like a reminder of like, you know, in the, the rudimentary, sometimes, um, almost boringly patternistic, you know, nature of our days where it's like, okay, another program, another program, like you kind of like lose, like actually this shit, when you think about it and the science of it, it is fun. It is, it is fun. That's why we do it. Sure. Um, and so being able to, to talk through our process will definitely, I think, invigorate the, the, the conversation, or I guess, um, definitely bring a, maybe a brighter light to what we do when yeah. it does feel like so like okay like another 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 and say oh no this is this is fun and this is why we like to do this stuff so without further ado we have five more muscle groups today we have yeah. glutes hamstrings calves erectors and pecs where do we want to start let's start with pecs word i love it um you want me to go first yeah go ahead take it away so this is given healthy shoulders I, I I choose loaded dips. Yeah, I went I went with loaded dips. For me, the big reason why I chose this is I want to be able to load up the pecs, for, especially for like a lot of guys who want to grow. We want to be able to train relatively heavy. And if you don't have a training partner, which more and more people I think are training alone these days, you want something that you can replicate. Loaded dips have the advantage that if you have a good setup, you start at the top of the movement pattern. So getting into position isn't a as much of a hassle as it would be like unracking a load or trying to get a machine up and getting into that initial position without someone lifting it off. So it's fairly replicable in that, in that uh, capacity. And then you like, you can load it up relatively safely because if you get to the bottom and you can't get back up, you just put your feet down, right? You just stand yeah. up. So there is an inherent safety to it as well. Uh, but again, given healthy shoulders, I would choose loaded dips. You know that I love dips. I would probably for myself choose weighted dips as far as the, the best type of movement for myself. But that is probably more anecdotal just based on what I feel I respond best to and what I'm able to um, you know, perform a relatively high volume with, high intensity. And even then, even though I feel like I do respond really well to dips, I always, in the back of my mind, am a little bit worried that my pet is going to explode whenever I'm at the bottom of weighted dip. 
So whenever I was writing down my selections here, I, I couldn't overlook that. I couldn't overlook this like nagging fear of, you never know when yeah. your, your pack is just going to shred at the bottom of a dip, you know, even with body weight sometimes. I'm a little bit nervous or yeah. there's like maybe a little bit of a pool in my armpit where I'm like, that doesn't feel that good right now, you know? And you, I know that you have clicky shoulders, so your shoulders mm -hmm. are all fucked up. My shoulders are not amazing, but they're not as beat up as yours, I don't think. Uh, but even then, you know, it's like kind of uh, a crapshoot, whether yeah. you're going to have a day where you go in there and everything's going to feel really smooth and solid on dips and you're going to have like a really awesome session. You're going to wake up the next morning. It's all going to be pecs and triceps. Or if you're going to go in there and everything, everything's going to be clicking, you're going to have yeah. a lot of like pulling and straining. Your shoulder blades are going to be moving all in, like fucked up patterns. Like one's winging, one won't move. The next day you wake up and everything except for your, your pecs and triceps is sore beat up, right? right? So I think, again, I love weighted dips. I would probably, I would probably say weighted dips would be like the, the highest magnitude exercise for me but if i was to weigh the pros and cons i think that machine dips or excuse me not machine dips machine chest press wow um would probably be my go-to and the caveats there are it has to be a, a replicable machine the machine has to be set up in a way that allows you to get a full stretch it has to you know, allow you to somewhat bring the handle across an adduct, mm -hmm. your or, or your upper arm at lockout. Um, I don't want there to be like these super fucked up handles where like I've used chest press machines before where the handles are literally like overly pronated. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. Like makes no sense. So all of those caveats out of the way, I would say a good chest press machine is is probably what I would select if I'm trying to strike the finest balance between volume intensity frequency risk reduction stimulus and magnitude of stimulus etc so yeah and also another thing i do like about machine chest press in general is i i feel relatively comfortable traversing the lower end of the hypertrophic rep range and then also like the higher end and even doing intensity techniques right like mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to do like a heavy set of like five or six and it's also pretty easy quote unquote easy easy to perform to do like a set of 20 you know yeah. and then it's it's trivial to do a drop set you know if you're using a, a pin loaded chest press you can do rest pauses you can do myo reps clusters you can do a ton of stuff so i feel like the, the versatility there is probably what swings my boat yeah yeah i went back and forth on chest press i think i think i had to put less parameters on dips in my head yeah. um of like hey like healthy shoulders and the trade-off is yeah well this movement is going to require more stability i want that like i do yeah. want that for like a holistic athlete um being able to move your body in space is super important to me uh, and i think that even for women um getting them to be able to do even body weight dips right and getting them to do the be able, sorry getting them to be able to do that for reps it's a powerful thing for them and it's an, an overall better thing for them as an athlete on their journey and also i can hold in the same regard that a chest press a machine chest press is going to be uh, better for the long haul and i also think more more easily implemented especially yeah. early on right it's you know you don't have to up too. it's hard to exactly to yeah. exactly like you don't have to worry about a person's uh coordination right it's like just sit down and you know stay on the seat for the most part and then as you get more and more comfortable you'll figure out how to position your body to get the most you know activation the most power so on and so forth and then i also think about the chest press the seated horizontal ones that have like the foot spot where you can like push mm -hmm. it those are super nice like yeah. if if for sure we could use that machine i would choose that machine i'm like this is the one because i do think for me the big thing that I even I know is for myself with my shoulders and my elbows. Um, like I love a good decline press. Um, I even love the, um, the super incline press that Grandview has the one that's like yeah. almost fucking, I, it feels so good on me. Yeah. Um, but 
I noticed that whenever I get to a certain load, it's more about me being able to support my shoulders while getting into position. Mm -hmm. And it's super frustrating. Cause I'm like, once it's there, I got it. Like, I'm good. Like I can go for reps, eight, 12, I'm good. But getting up is always just fucking annoying and it hurts a little bit. And you're like, I don't even want to do this. Um, and I think if I could just start in like an upright position, <laughs> you know, and like finish, you know, down at the eccentric and like push a button and it hydraulically lifts it back up to like, that'd be great. Um, yeah, yeah. but like, again, like a self spot machine where you can kind of push your foot out. A lot of the prime machines have that now, uh, even for like machine pullovers and stuff like that, they have that where you can put your foot on it, gets you into a comfortable position so you can start. And then from there you release and the resistance kind of kicks in and you're good from there. So, uh, yeah, I think conditionally I would probably go more with like a, a chest press because of its implementation and its ability to kind of be added wherever, whenever, for whoever. Um, whereas dips, I think, will have more of a restriction, especially when it comes down to pushing intensity. Yeah. Um, give me a sleeper pick. Sleeper pick for, for backs. And then also an overrated. So overrated and then, and then a sleeper. Okay. Overrated. I'll start with overrated. Barbell chest press. Um, like a barbell bench press. Bench press. Yeah, bench yeah, press. Yeah. Bench press. Yeah. yeah. For sure overrated. Like, it, 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 it's... For strength, if you're training for strength, if you're training to be a power lifter and you want a stronger bench, fantastic, great. If you're training for pec growth, pec development, work capacity, so on and so forth, uh, I mean, if you're going to go free weight, go with a dumbbell setup, right? I think that that's more advantageous to long-term goals if those are your goals. Um, but I also think if you want to even go better, you go with the machine. Right, go machine chest press just because, again, risk aversion, being able to push them longer, push them harder um, without all of the other um, factors at play with a free weight setup. And then also, again, the restrictions that come with setting up with a barbell. I think just it's not worth it, which is actually interesting. Slight digression. You and I should work on this together. Um, I've been putting together like a compilation, like a little series on why I haven't used a barbell for any movement pattern in however long. I was like, oh kind of interesting to think about because everyone's so like gung-ho on barbells and i'm like i haven't touched a barbell in some time and i'm like i'm still jacked right i'm still good um which i think would be just an interesting thing to talk about it's, a, it's a convenience thing for most people and there's I mean, there's still always something to be said for a barbell you know it's it's the the root aspect of lifting and if you're wanting and needing to go heavy and just create a lot of mechanical tension, provided your anatomy is set up and structured in a way that is conducive to that specific movement pattern, like it, it can be a really great modality. And I'm thinking for myself, something like a, a stiff leg deadlift, you know, I am able to get a fuck ton out of barbell stiff leg deadlifts because of my anatomy. But if I do a barbell back squat, it's just going to beat me up because of my anatomy and by the same token like i've always been relatively good at barbell bench press but it still tends to beat up my wrists and my elbows over time so if i do a high frequency and a high volume of barbell bench i just get beat up yeah like i get stronger for sure but it comes with a price so it's always been very useful for me to use that movement strategically and kind of sparsely and get a lot more volume from things like dumbbell presses dips machine presses etc but um yeah you know I, I agree with you that especially like once you get to a certain level of advancement you absolutely do not need a barbell you do not and the reason why barbells are convenient at that point is because presumably you're you're so strong, strong. Mm -hmm. that getting dumbbells in a position is just going to be such a fucking pain in the ass that you're going to be losing potential volume in the process of getting a dumbbell in a position, which actually was my issue for a while, right? Like I was like, okay, I can, you know, go bench with 365 or I can do dumbbell presses with like, you know, 170s. Like, what do I want to do? I'd much rather do bench with 365, even with all the caveats, right? Because I just don't want to have to move gigantic fucking dumbbells around and like throw them over my head. So again, you know, there are, there are use cases for all of these things, but I, I 110% agree with you that at a certain point, you don't need barbells. And if you're advanced enough, you should also understand how to 
make your training efficient and effective without needing a barbell also. My sleeper. Right, underrated. Underrated. Yes. Yeah, my, my, my sleeper would probably be deficit push ups. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I would say deficit push ups. Um, again, the, the modularity of it is great, right? You can start just from the floor. Someone can start from their knees. Um, but deficit is obviously, to me, it's, it's awesome because you get an awesome stretch and a really safe space, and they will fuck you up if done correctly, if done with a good slow tempo. You can add a band. You can, I mean, you can do a lot with it. Um, and even, again, with advancement, the more advanced you get, the more you realize how to make push-ups really, really hard. Like you have people that kind of race to being able to do 25, 50 straight, whatever. And I was like, great, fantastic. You're just like, <laughs> but when you can make 10 push-ups feel harder than fucking anything, like you're doing something and you're going to get a lot back without giving so much, like getting yep. something into position or training really, really hard on a, you know, a heavy machine, so on and so forth. So yeah, I would definitely go push-ups. I agree. I agree. I was going to say, Deficit push ups as well. I was going to see if I could add something to it, but since we agree, we could probably just move on. But was, yeah, that's push up sleeper. If you don't do deficit push ups through packs, you're missing out. Was your overrated barbell? Bench yeah, I was going to say barbell bench as well. Um, mostly just to make the point that barbell bench is such a like cultural thing. Like it, it's just it's entrenched because. We're also used to the idea of a barbell bench press, and we see it all the time. And it's it's just such like a measure of like strength and young male like you know testosterone levels. So yep. like we all just kind of associate with barbell bench press. I mean, even most people that have played sports, right? Like football, barbell bench press. Like that's right. all it is, right? Like that's all you think about. That's the way that you measure up to everyone else. So I would say, yeah. In terms of pack development, there are a lot of movements that you can do that have a better ROI than barbell bench. And then, yeah, my sleeper is also going to be just a push-up. So we're on the same page there. All right, moving on, let's jump to actually Raptors. Yeah, two Raptors. That's, that's what I was thinking too. Um, well, I went first. You go ahead and go first for this one. All right. So I'm going to say safety bargain mornings. Mm. Okay. So. Yeah. yeah. So I would venture to say that very much like my trap pick in the last episode, most people probably have not tried Safety Bar Good Mornings. And the people that have tried them, there's probably, you know, 10% that actually enjoyed them or got anything out of them and didn't just absolutely hate every moment of performing those good mornings. But what is unique about safety bar is that it rolls. So the, the the weight is loaded more anteriorly, so more forward. And the handles kind of force you to pull down or push up. So if you're doing a good morning, your natural instinct is to pull down on the bar. And it's kind of hard to turn off that instinct, especially if you're using any kind of reasonably heavy load. Okay. So what ends up happening is whenever you're doing a good morning, you pull down on the handles and then the bar swings a little bit, which pushes the weight even more anterior and pulls the pad even higher up on your traps on your neck, which then, in other words, kind of rounds your back. Mm -hmm. So rounding is one of those terms that I think just so many people have an aversion to, but if done in an intelligent and controlled way, Spinal flexion is absolutely necessary way of moving your spine for, for one. Like it's it's part of the range of motion that you can get into. So if you can get into that range of motion, it is healthy to do it. But you have to know how to do that safely. So provided all of those, you know, prerequisites are being met, if you do something like a safety bar in the morning. That is loading your erectors from literally your lower back, like your, your lower lumbar, all the way up to your cervical spine. So your erectors, for anybody who doesn't know, they, they don't just run through your low back, through what you can see through your lumbar region. They extend all the way up through your thoracic spine, through your, your mid back, through your rib cage. And you also have 
smaller erector muscles, smaller postural muscles that run up into your neck as well. So if you want to train all of those muscles, you have to do something that loads your back through spinal flexion and extension from top to bottom, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. And that is what a safety bar good morning does. Again, a very advanced movement. Like I would not give this to someone who is still feeling their way around the gym. I would not give this to someone who needs to bring their low back strength up or whose low back is a weak point because that is just asking for trouble, asking for someone to get injured. But this is definitely for someone who is very advanced, who already knows how to brace their abs, how to go through full range of motion, how to do good morning safely. All of those contexts and caveats need to be hit. But um, but yeah, safety bar good morning for erector development. There's very few things that I think will be able to replicate that. Yeah, no, I I would 100% agree with that. Um, That just rationale there for that. I went a little bit different um, or a little bit a slightly different direction. I also, just before I get to mine, really like the safety bar hypers. Like those are really nice. Now, obviously, like you can't load them up like you could a good morning. Um, However, I think it probably goes more in the direction of my thinking of not just not being afraid of spinal flexion, but encouraging controlled spinal flexion. So my choice is actually like eventually heavy Jefferson curls. Um, It's a painstaking fucking movement. If you've ever done them before, they take forever if done correctly. However, um, the older I get, the more I really focus on being able to move my spine in more ways than just like, oh, I can extend it and I can also keep it neutral because I've been so rigid in my patterns and trying to make sure that I don't fuck myself up. But no, like you and I used to traverse this space ever so slightly with our squat press, right? Allowing our butts to actually come up a little bit and our low backs around, but like really controlling that. And so that was always an interesting thing when clients would see me do it and they go, hey, you told me to, to keep my butt down. I'm like, well, yes, but not because of the whole like don't round your back thing, but because that range of motion, that control of my spine was earned. Like I did that shit slowly. I didn't always perform these this way, which then I think spawned like almost like evolution of thought where I'm like, people should be training this earlier, right? This shouldn't just be something that they kind of happen upon as they advance in a certain movement. This should be something that everyone focuses on early and often. And so, and you can load the fuck out of them once you get really good at them and as long as you're patient, right? So I'm at a point now where I just stand on a couple of boxes, I'll hold two dumbbells, they might be like 80 to 100 pounds, and you just do it super, super slowly for like sets of three to five. And you will fuck your erectors up and your hamstrings. Like I have your whole posterior chain is being challenged in a way that is very unique. Uh, so that would probably be where I would venture for the for the erectors. Yeah, and erectors are one of those muscle groups that everyone thinks that they have well developed erectors because your erectors have a very strong muscle tone to them because they're postural muscle. So whenever you touch them. They feel hard, pretty much no matter what. And that that gets in people's heads that they have very overactive or overdeveloped erectors. Like I've even talked to female clients that I have who mention that their erectors are dominant. And I'm like, how the fuck would your erectors be dominant? Like you're a 95 pound girl, but you don't have enough muscle on your body for anything to be dominant, right? So... I do think that that's a little bit of a mind fuck. And then also, obviously, the the rhetoric around rounding your back and maintaining a flat back. And even for so long, a lot of the cues that you would hear during deadlifts, during squats, were like, arch your back. Like, keep your back arched, keep your chest up, look up, like those types of things. And I don't, I don't necessarily think that they're wrong. But I think that it was misplaced and misguided because if you constantly tell younger lifters that rounding your back is that and that you always want to keep an arched low back, then that gets in their head and that carries over into literally everything that they do. And then they're always scared of going into spinal flexion. But again, spinal flexion is not a bad thing. If you're doing a one rep max deadlift, like, don't go into spinal flexion voluntarily, for sure. 
But if you look at some of the best power lifters in the world, they start from a position of spinal flexion. And you'll see someone doing a conventional deadlift and their back is actually rounded. Mm -hmm. And that throws a lot of people off. They're like, how, like you're going to get hurt. It's like, no, they're not going to get hurt because they're starting from that position. They've strengthened themselves in that position. They're not pulling and they're not initiating from a hyperextended spinal position and then going into flexion and rounding their back and being pulled into that because of weakness. They're starting from a position of strength and they're carrying out their lift from that. So that's a huge difference as well, right? But you can strengthen yourself in these unsafe positions. Mm -hmm. They're only unsafe because we never go into them to begin with. And I, I think that that's where a lot of people can trace their back injuries to is you guard against spinal flexion and rounding of the low back so much that you don't allow yourself to ever go into those ranges of motion. And then if you ever do enter those ranges of motion by accident in normal life, whatever it is, you get hurt. Well, obviously, because you have no tolerance there. You have no tolerance beyond neutral. So if you go into even a little bit of flexion, like picking up your laundry basket, you're going to hurt yourself, right? So by training, those ranges deliberately, whether that's through something as simple as like cat cows, right? Like mobility work, or whether it's something like a safety bar in the morning or a Jefferson curl, or even like a, a Swiss ball hyperextension, where it's a deliberate low back hyperextension, then that is going to be able to train those ranges of motion up enough to where you can make your other lifts safer. So that is another big aspect of this that. Erectors are easy to overlook, but if more people took them seriously and took training them directly seriously, again, even something as simple as like doing a couple of sets of higher rep, like, you know, Swiss ball hypers and just being very, very, very specific in targeting your erectors, you would, I guarantee you, you would get a much lower incidence of low back injuries later down the road because it's not just your erectors being stronger. It's everything being built around getting into those deeper ranges of motion more spinal flexion without being so guarded it's it's a more natural state to be in so yeah that's my kind of final spiel on erectors go out there and get erected people yes um all right so we got calves hamstrings glutes obviously i think we're going to end on glutes yeah. um to keep people's attention from here on out so do we want to do we want to what do calves and then hamstrings Let's do hamstrings first. Hamstrings first? Yeah. All right. So hamstrings first. I specifically went with deficit stiff leg deadlifts. So my rationale here, uh, because I think that for some people that might be kind of interesting considering that usually when you add a deficit to something, it's viewed as more advanced. And it is. And also, I think that a lot of times with just deadlift patterns in general, people's compensatory mechanisms, the idea of, of cheating the movement or just yanking and, and trying to just move the load, especially when it's a barbell, uh, kick in earlier when things get heavy. Whereas a deficit kind of corrects for that. It, it necessitates you use a lighter load, um, especially if you are using like a, a decent tempo here. And you are fully going to lengthen the hamstrings and challenge the hamstrings, which is super important. Um, and again, doing it long-term and safely I don't know that there's another movement pattern that you can um, find that will replicate that. Also, you can do this on a lot of different variations. You can use a cable, you can use a belt squat, you can use dumbbells. So no matter where you are in like your training journey or your advancement, you can find some sort of modality that will be safe for you to use and execute this pattern. I also said deficit stiff leg deadlifts. So we're in agreement here. And for many of the same reasons that, that you already stated, being able to load the hamstrings pretty much maximally, like with very, very high loads, high intensity, heavy weights. I think that's very important just for, you know, general stimulation of the hamstrings. But the deficit, I think, is very important because you want to be able to get as much lengthening through your hams as possible. Even just going to the floor and standardizing the range of motion that way you're leaving a little bit left at the end. Your hamstrings aren't getting fully stretched, fully lengthened. So some people are going to have limited mobility, whether it's mobility coming from like the low back, whether it's flexibility coming from the hamstrings or even calves. 
So there are going to be limitations that pop up for some people. So I would say that, I mean, we've had in the clients, I've had clients before that, um, you know, can't even do a stiff lever deadlift to the floor mm -hmm. because they're already running into limitations. So they do a stiff leg deadlift and it's stopping like, you know, a couple of inches off the ground. So for them, that is literally the equivalent of a deficit stiff leg deadlift. Yeah. For most people, you're going to be able to get beyond the floor in terms of your range of motion. And if you can do it, you should be aiming to get as much lengthening through your hands as possible to make the movement as effective and efficient as possible for creating that stimulus. If you get more range of motion, like what you said, you don't have to use as much weight, but the weight is going to go further. So if you can get the same amount of stimulation out of 300 pounds with a deficit versus 400 pounds to the floor, the former is the better option, 100%. No matter what your ego might think, for hamstring development, you want, again, you want to maximize the stimulus that you're getting. And if you can do that while limiting your central nervous system fatigue and the potential failure points outside of your hamstrings, that's going to be a good bet, right? Again, you don't want your upper back to fail. You don't want your grip to fail. You don't want your, you know, your bracing your abdominal bracing to fail before your hamstrings do. So there's a lot of things at play. But, uh, but yeah, you know, like, I think that no matter what, I was always going to go with some kind of like heavier hinge pattern here. But maybe an interesting question is if we're going with a knee flexion pattern for hamstring development, which would you go with? Yeah, I'd probably just stick to the basics and go a seated leg curl. Um, yeah. Stability. Stability, volume. Um, a, a good one, right? And there have been some that are just poorly engineered that like fuck with your knees and shit like that. But as long as, you know, that was standing, you're able to be able to set up in a replicable way. You're not going to have as much of the, uh, the ability to move as you could if you were doing a lying variation, right? Um, if you get even more advanced, you can do the, the Mike Ezertel variation, right? Where he's like sitting on the edge of the seat and like really like swinging into it. But I think that you know, it, it sets itself up for long-term progress. Um, and if you do leg curls, like I think a lot of people sometimes shy away from leg curls or, um, or I guess I just say consistent leg curls. This isn't like extensions is one. They fucking suck. They're not a fun thing to do, especially as you get good at them. But however, when you do get good at them, they're a great movement for progress because you can standardize virtually every component of it. As long as you maintain your integrity there, you can continue to get better. And then once you get to a point to where you've stacked the machine, okay, well now you can add intensity techniques, you can change the tempos, uh, so on and so forth, right? You can add two up, one down, that type deal, depending on the, the machine setup. I've seen some leg curls that will let you do that. Seated leg curls will let you do that, but most of them won't. But again, you get my point. You can diversify the movement and continue to get better at it in a uh, pretty straightforward way. Yeah, and hamstrings are going to be a really unique muscle group because they are biarticular. They're going to cross the knee joint and the hip joint. And because of that, I almost feel like you have to break it up into thinking of it as knee flexion and hip extension to be able to get the most out of your hamstring training. I think that if you had to choose one, it would be hip extension, so some kind of like hinge pattern. Again, if you only could choose one, but most people have the luxury of also being able to perform some kind of like knee flexion stuff. So the way that I try and do this stuff is for heavier loads, for higher intensities, for lower rep ranges, go more like hinge based patterns. If you're going for higher volumes, uh, higher rep ranges, uh, metabolic stress, um, you know, anything that is going to be an intensity technique more so designed around in increasing and maximizing volume. So like a drop set, like a load drop set go with hamstring flexion based movements but i also do agree with you that i would i would choose a seated hamstring curl over like a lying or a, a standing for sure but i i have seen people try and argue the um like a prone lying hamstring curl over seated and their rationale is that it allows you to get into um you know more of a shortened hamstring muscle length and for me like for me i, I see it but i also don't I don't buy it. And the reason I don't buy it is because anyone who has performed a good seated leg curl versus a even a good lying leg curl can vouch for the difference in comfort level between yeah. the two and also where the failure points tend to come from. With prone hamstring curls, 
yes, your hamstrings are going to get fucked up, but your low back also is doing a lot of work, a lot of work. It is also really easy to cheat. It's a, an easy movement to just kind of swing your hips around and use your erectors to get a few more reps there, maybe even cheat the range of motion a smidge because it's hard to standardize the range of motion, right? Like how high up were you really going? Right. Did you get full knee flexion or did you stop, stop like 10 degrees short, right? It's very hard to measure those things. With seated, I feel like it's so much easier to standardize. You lock your knees into place so like you're not cheating at all. Like you fucking can't cheat. I guess you can lean forward or lean back, which will change the length of your hamstring. But I actually think that that is a, a pro to the seated hamstring curl because you can lean forward or you can lean backward and change the length of your hamstring. So you can turn it into a mechanical drop set if you want to. So you can almost even think about it as two separate movements, whether you're leaning back or whether you're hinged forward. And that's the way that I kind of try and think about it as well. So, um, so yeah, for anybody who has ever done seated hamstring curls i i would say they probably would also choose those as superior to to lying and i think standing is mostly just like a lazy person's hamstring curl variation because they don't want to bend over or like lock themselves in or whatever but i also like doing stand, standing leg curls from time to time but um yeah yeah we can move on yeah. i just want to get my, my standing, piece in there standing actually pisses me off because i don't always want to be relegated to unilateral performance like i'm like hey like, i just would like to do yeah, a, yeah. a bilateral like you know setup here um then you know, i yeah, i think that like you said anyone who's performed like a seated will agree unless they're vain and want a good video then of course you want to go lying so that you can get the, the full length and version of your hamstrings and your yeah. ass up in yeah there. get like a nice ass shot yeah. too gotta get it right yeah, up right up the gooch yep. Yep. Right, right, let's go abs so not for me uh because my knees are it's weird i don't know what it is but for some reason whenever i have a decent amount of pressure sitting atop my knee um it just it doesn't feel really good and it's hard for me to actually focus but i would say a seated calf raise um mostly because so much of what your calves are able to do as far as like growth is concerned is going to be based on your genetics um like being able to hypertrophy this this muscle group is it's tough right it's gonna, it's gonna take you some time and for the people who have been able to do it yourself um a lot of it comes from the ability to load them up and if you think about okay uh standing well then you have the axial load that you have to take into you know consideration there and depending on what you're doing throughout that day now you have to okay well what do I want to give it to? You know, I, I don't know that there's anything that you're like, hey, I can just put four plates on this bitch, sit down, bear down, get as much dorsiflexion as possible, fully lengthen the muscle, drive up. Like, for the most part, most people listening to this don't know what failure on a seated calf raise feels like because you can go for fucking ever. Like, you can almost get it, always get another rep. Um, and because of that, it's, it's pretty safe. It has a little safety at the bottom. So if you get to the point where you do fail, you just slip your feet off of it and you let it hit the safety and then you take the weight off. And so I think because you want to be able to really get close to failure here, you want to push that intensity. I think that it offers a lot in the way of being able to push really hard and fail really safe. So I, I was almost thinking of this as having to make a decision between, do I want to choose something that is more gastroc focused or more soleus focused so with seated it's going to be much more soleus focused but at a subtle trade-off to you know gastroc stimulus and then i decided to go with a uh, machine donkey calf raise mm. and it is a little bit niche like it's a hard machine to find it's definitely not going to be like in your normal crunch fitness or anything like that but there have been a couple times i've used a good machine donkey calf raise and it feels awesome it feels yeah. awesome especially if they're like pin loaded so it's very easy to change the weight and you get a lot of the the benefits of a standing without the axial load that you were just talking about and it feels like a comfortable or more comfortable way of performing a leg press calf raise yes and i've always been pretty staunchly against linear leg press calf raises if you're having to load like four to five plates on a calf or, or excuse me on a leg press just to perform calf raises like your energy could probably be used better elsewhere but a pin loaded leg press if you're gonna do calf raises on that like that's pretty simple to do it's yep. pretty easy um it doesn't require a ton of energy a ton of setup and it's 
pretty safe as well, right? Like, again, if you go back to a linear leg press or plate loaded leg press, and you're adding a ton of weight on there. Well, you know, it just takes one subtle movement of your knee to then get fucking buckled. Yeah. And you get pinned under there, and that's not what anybody wants. So I have always really liked pin loaded leg press calf raises. I've always felt like it's it's comfortable. It feels like something you can do relatively often. You don't have to worry about any injury issues or overuse issues. I've never really run into problems with like my Achilles tendon getting irritated, which I have with heavier leg press calf raises and heavier machine standing calf raises before. But again, you know, like I think if I were to take something like a, a leg press calf raise and try to make that better, I would turn it into a donkey calf raise. So that's where this ended up coming from. But, but no, I, I think that the ultimate limiting factor for most people with their calves or with their calf development is that they just don't go through a full range of motion. And this is something that I even ran into whenever I was trying to revamp how my calf training would look when I was a, a bit younger. But you think that you're training your calves, but what you're really doing is you're just training like a middle range of motion. Most people just bounce. They use all Achilles tendon. They don't actually train their calves very well. And they definitely don't train them in the extreme ranges of motion that are going to be most growth propagating, right? So very, very deep stretch through your calves and a very, very hard contraction through plantar flexion. Mm -hmm. Most people absolutely have never felt what true plantar flexion is like and what that what that feels like because if you have then it feels like your calves are about to fucking seize up and cramp and pull themselves in the back of your kneecap yeah and i think there have been a couple times like have we ever done like squatting calf raises together yeah you know what i'm talking about uh -huh. um there have been a couple times i've done that movement to where i feel like my calves are actually going to cramp up because they're getting like so contracted at the top most people try to use too much weight with any calf raise variation that they're doing, especially standing calf raise variations, or even seated, to where they are only working a middle range of motion, and they're not actually allowing themselves to get into those extremes. So if there's one piece of advice I could give to anybody for their calf development is like, go lighter than you would expect to go. And whenever you're in the contracted position and you're in plantar flexion, try and get a little bit more, yeah. a little bit more, a little bit more. Because again, most people just have absolutely no idea what it feels like to get into that really, really extended shortened position or yeah, that very, very shortened position at the, at the extremes, you know? Yeah. No, I didn't even think about a donkey calf raise. I would a hundred percent agree. Most people don't understand, um, or have an experience. Like you said, true, I would say fully flexed like full angle flexion full dorsiflexion um like that deep deep stretch especially as you get deeper in a set like what that feels like because that does not feel good either but like you said a really really like strong emphasized plantar flexion plantar flexion when i'm coaching this i also i like to think about like dancers and how like they are exaggerating getting on their toes but yeah i didn't think about a donkey calf raise and i think that the benefit there too is if you want to go unilateral it's a very easy unilateral setup that also feels safe uh, and it's funny because and i'm selling out my own pocket here probably because i've seen too many scary movies final destination you know fucked me up but i will will not you know give somebody a leg press calf raise something in my head it's not the no, knees yeah. actually it's the fact that i'm like your feet are like they inches slip. yeah if they slip and yeah. this fucking plate comes down on you i'm like that's all i see in my head is like if you're trying to get deep 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 dorsiflexion and your toes come up off that thing and it just slips off the ball of your foot and all of a sudden you know eight plates are falling down on you i'm like ah just it's a bad movie uh, so that's why i won't i won't give them i have people who go oh i just did this instead i'm like okay like i'm not giving them to you but if you want yeah, to yeah. Them, like, go ahead you know uh but yeah i didn't think about donkey calf raises that's a that's a good call out yeah, and another bit of it there is that I think that donkey calf raises are pretty unique in how they allow you to overemphasize the stretch of your calves. Again, just anyone get into that position, like bend over, bend over at the waist, maintain a, a neutral low back. You'll feel your hamstring stretching, but as soon as you elevate your toes, you'll feel a very, very, very deep stretch 
through your calves as well. And again, part of this is because your calves are a fire to each other muscle also. So your calves will attach behind your knee, but up above your knee. So they're crossing your knee joint. And they're also crossing the ankle joint. So because of that, they're going to get kind of pre-stretched as well. So if you can keep your knees extended and if you can hinge over at the waist, there's going to be almost this pre-stretch that happens. So I think that that's also important. And then if you're in a uh, plantar flex position, or excuse me, if you're in the donkey position, getting into plantar flexion, it always is just a little bit easier than if you were standing. So again, I think that, that there are multiple benefits there. You get more stretch, you get easier plantar flexion, or it's easier to, to feel that plantar flexion out. All right, let's go into this last one. Glutes, let's wrap this up. Weird. Well, I went first for calves, so. All right, yeah, so I'm just, I'm actually going to say a machine hip thrust. Ha. Huh. I did too. Is that what you said? Yeah, that's what I said. Jesus Christ. I feel like we, we've been working together for too long. Yeah, all I was going to say we spent too um, much time together. No, that's, that's fine. So, for. Which machine? I was making which which machine? The one that that was at the 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 gym, the Nautilus. The Nautilus. Yeah, the Nautilus. yeah, Nautilus. Same. Okay. It's that's the bad. Um, no, no. So I I would say that glutes are difficult because there are multiple ways that you can hit your glutes and train your glutes very effectively. The way that I am trying to think of this is what is going to give the most bang for your buck. And what is going to be something that will provide a very high magnitude of stimulus, a very targeted stimulus as well, and also have few failure points or potential failure points outside of the glutes. And I know that I've kind of like migrated my criteria around a little bit as we've been going through some of these movements, but I, I definitely want to caveat why i chose machine hip thrust rather than something like a hinge variation like an rdl or a squat pattern like you know uh, a bulgarian split squat or something like that which are awesome movements for glute development by the way so one thing i had to really think about was do i want do i want to maximize the shortened position of the glutes or do i want to maximize the lengthened position of the glutes or lengthened state and i just met with the, the hip thrust variation because i felt like if we are going for uniqueness and muscular potential to get into those ranges of motion, it's probably going to just have to be a hip thrust. Like I, I think in my mind, it has to be some kind of hip thrust variation. So that's why I chose it. Machine based on ease of use and re replicabili wow, replicability. And in the, yeah, the ability to uh, standardize the, the reps, ability to push, with high intensity. So if you can get a really good machine, um, there are some of them that absolutely suck ass. So, you know, context dependent, it has to be a good machine. But if you can find a good hip thrust machine, I think that that's an invaluable add to your your glutes training protocols. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree. Um, also, like, like you said, low margin of error, um, biggest bang for the buck, greatest yeah. magnitude. Um, you can send virtually anyone to a machine hip thrust and tell them to die there, right? Like, and, and see really, really good results. I also, in my head, went, okay, even though for advanced athletes, I'm like, let's actually mix in, like, RDLs or Bulgarians. I had more arguments as to why they could fail or why they could be suboptimal. So if, I, I think for, especially the women, the people who were coming to us for glute training, if you are working with a woman who is relatively novice, they're are different phases in their progression of strength and work capacity capabilities so and even just confidence a woman might be at a point where she could pick up 60s 70s 80s but in her mind she's actually more focused on picking up the load like holding that in her hands feels so foreign because it's so fucking heavy even if she can perform this movement pattern with it so you have to have these little pit stops of like hey like Let's get your straps out. You can hold this. Like this is, I know it seems heavy. This is a big dumbbell, but you are strong enough to do this as long as we keep our technique and our setup patterns and so on and so forth. So I think you have less to overcome. Machine hip thrust are related to dumbbell RDLs. And then I think for Bulgarians, there's a sheer will, right? That's the difficulty of this unilateral 
disadvantageously set up a pattern where it's like you might be strong enough but like i have to get you to like grit your teeth and push through this grueling fucking exercise um, whereas i'm going to probably find less of an obstacle in getting you to push similar intensity on a machine hip thrust so those were my major major knocks for not choosing those movement patterns and then to your point a really really good machine i chose the nautilus because you can sit all the way down like you can move your feet around and, and find a good position, but you can sit all the way down and take your hips through a decent amount of hip flexion in comparison to other machines. I think the one note that I would add is I would, it'd be cool if the Nautilus was, or they had a pen loaded variation where the load didn't deload at the bottom, right? Because as the, as you sit down, the weights kind of sing, swing backwards and obviously deloads at the bottom. But if it was pen loaded, that'd be fucking dope, right? Yeah. Like being able to have a cable keep tension you know to some degree throughout the entirety of the movement pattern and you know adding pauses so on and so forth but given a good machine machine hip thrust or where i will send people to die to grow some cheeks another point that i definitely want to make is glute training specifically targeting the glutes or biasing the glutes or trying to bring the glutes up while forsaking other muscle groups right it, it is difficult in the sense of most people's glutes are stronger than other muscle groups even if you have underdeveloped glutes compared to your quads for example your glutes are still going to be stronger than your quads just by the nature of those muscle groups right your glutes are bigger they have generally more type 2 fibers they're going to be more power oriented so because of that they're generally not going to be the failure points of a lot of these compound movements. So if you're doing a Bulgarian, it's not generally your glutes that fail. It's generally your quads, or it's your stability, or it's your grip holding on to uh, the load. If you're doing an RDL, it's typically not your glutes that fail. It's your low back. It's your upper back. It's your grip. It's your hamstrings. If you were doing a, a barbell squat, again, same thing, right? Like, it's not the glutes typically that are reaching their muscular failure point. It's something else that's causing you to end that set. It doesn't mean that those exercises are useless for training your glutes, but it does mean that you have to take all of that into account whenever you're programming these things. So for the glutes to grow at their maximal rate, maximal capacity, they have to be taken to their, or close to their failure point right so just like if you were to be training your biceps no whenever your biceps are about to fail because if you're doing a preacher curl fuck all is helping it's right. your biceps right and it's not like your lats are helping you do a preacher curl it's if you fail it's because your biceps hit their failure point so the more that you can find exercises like preacher curls for your glutes the more that you're going to be able to control your rir your muscular rir right because you can have a movement RIR, mm -hmm. which is a little bit different than if you were to overlay that with how close that actual muscle is to its failure point. So the more compound an exercise is, the more that you're going to run into movement reps or movement failure points rather than specific muscle group failure points. And that's a very important caveat, I think. So something like hip thrust, you can eliminate a lot of the potential failure points that you might be running into with something like a hinge pattern or something like a squat pattern. And the more that you can eliminate those, the more that you'll know that if you're getting close to failure, it's because your glutes are also close to failure rather than something else that might be artificially limiting the volume that you're able to get. So I, I think that that's very important, again, especially for the glutes because they are a complex muscle group and they're very integrated with a lot of other movements, a lot of other patterns. And they can get targeted and effectively hit with a lot of different things, a lot of different exercises. So, like, so when we talk about like glute training, it's it's simple, but it, it's complex, right? Like, there are certain movements that you should almost always gravitate towards, and you shouldn't really complicate it beyond that. But it's complex in the sense of like you need to know how to balance those movements as well. You need to understand like, okay, well, I need to do a little bit more volume of machine hip thrusts compared to you know, stiff leg deadlifts, but maybe I can go a bit heavier on my stiff leg deadlifts and I can use higher intensities there, but stay actually a little bit shorter compared to a shorter failure, shyer failure compared to something like a hip thrust. 
And hit thrust you can do with higher frequency. So like, because you're not running into the same axial loading issues, you're not running into the same, um, you know, multiple failure points. You're not running into the same issues with like high risk of injury with every rep that you perform. You're not going to get hurt doing machine hip thrusts like you would if you're doing like a good morning, for example, right? You can do hip thrusts much more readily throughout your week. You can do them two, three, four times a week if you want to, if you're, especially if you're varying your patterns and varying your rep ranges. How often are you going to do an RDL variation, right? Like with high intensity, not that often, right? So again, I think kind of going back to what we were talking about with, I think it was the chest press at the beginning, the hip thrusts come with a versatility that you can scale low rep ranges, high rep ranges. You can throw a lot of intensity techniques at them. You can fail safely. And because of all of these things, I would say that it's probably the best all around new exercise. And that's why I would tend to gravitate towards it. But another important point here that I'll make before we sign off is that you do not have to have hip thrusts in your program for it to be a good glute program. You don't have to do hip thrusts. Hip thrusts are a very recent addition to most people's programming. Like it, they have not been around for too long, you know, on the grand scale. So I have to emphasize that hip thrusts are probably the the best movement that I can think of, best variation I can think of for glutes, but they're not mandatory by any means. Yeah, I think that's a, a really, really good point to make uh, because we've talked about this before. It's definitely when people think glutes, they think hip thrust. They don't think some of the other possibly more advantageous depending on their capabilities and advancement uh, movement patterns. And so obviously a great movement to give to the general masses if they're talking about, hey, I want to bring my glutes up and you're just like shouting into the void of people listening. It's like, all right, well, machine hip thrust, I feel safe yeah. telling you all to go do that. Um, however, when you get down to the individual athlete or individual programs, depending on the goals, like you said, it's it's not a must, right? It's not something you absolutely have to have if you want to develop really, really nice glutes. Uh, so yeah, no, I think that was, that was a good finale. That was good. Obviously, we would love to hear back from you guys. I've heard back from a couple of you. You guys don't talk to Bryce because, I mean, we get it. Uh, but, but obviously, we'd love to hear your feedback on your choices, your thoughts on our choices, our methodologies, uh, and obviously continue to jump on conversation on this, uh, on this topic. But thank you again for tuning in, and we will see you guys next time.